Today we are going to cover condominium conversion purchase agreement. It's actually condominium conversion uh, subdivision purchase agreement. Now, if you don't know what a condo conversion is, it's important to know what it is, or else you you don't know if you're going to use the right form or not. Okay, so. A condo conversion is condominium units that were once apartment units. What's the difference between condominium and apartment? When a person owns an apartment building, he basically will have one property tax bill. If he owns a four unit apartment complex, he will have one property tax bill. He will have one insurance. If a person owns an apartment building, he will get one property tax bill and one insurance for the entire apartment building. If you are in the Bay Area, you are in San Francisco, Many apartment buildings are subject to rent control. What that means is there's a limit as to how much rent you can raise in a year. Usually it's around 2% maximum. It's somewhere between one to 2%. But if you convert them to condominium units, you can actually remove the rent control from the building. So that's one way to get rid of rent control, is to convert your apartment units into condominium. If you have one such project, after your condo units, no, after your apartment units have been converted into condominium, San Francisco gives you a year to sell these condo units. And you're supposed to let the tenants live there until the year has expired, if they choose to live for one extra year in these units. Or you can offer to pay for their relocation if they decide not to continue living there, but if they decide to go somewhere else. And the earliest time you can give them the option will be after your condo conversion has been approved. If your condo conversion is four or less units, to get your apartment converted into condominium, all you need to do is to submit your application to the uh, city of San Francisco. And but if your units are greater than four, then you need to submit your condo conversion to the BRE. Okay? Now this rule applies statewide, not just to San Francisco. If you have an apartment unit in so this I would call that the um uh Uh, in Los Angeles, and you want to convert those into uh, condominium, you can do that. You don't have to convert only rent control uh, apartment building. It can be non-rent control. You can you can convert uh, non-rent controlled apartment units into condominium and sell them as condo units, as opposed to selling one entire building. You can individually you can sell these units individually. That's the benefit of uh, converting uh, condominium. In San Francisco, if you want to convert apartment units into condominium, it takes a long time. You have, if you do the normal waiting time, it takes like many years. But if you want to participate in lottery, if you win the lottery, 
you can convert it as soon as you won the lottery. But if you just want to wait and and queue up, it can take 10, 20 years before you can convert it. That's just too long for most people. So now if you're lucky, you get your, uh, you won the lotto, the lottery. You convert right away. You hire an architect to do the conversion for you. You submit to the building and safety and they approve everything. And the whole process will probably take about six months. So after they are converted, if it's the first time selling, then you use this special purchase agreement. If it's uh, not the first time selling, if it's been sold before and now you're the second, uh, now the first buyer is selling to the second buyer, then this is a regular RPA. The form that we're using is when the owner who completed the condo conversion is selling it for the first time to a buyer, they need to have a special form. And that's the form we're trying to learn today, okay? Some of you probably know that I have uh, two listings in Bernal Heights, and those are supposed to hit the market in June or July. So, because my client is selling the condo conversion for the first time, then he has, he may need, he's probably gonna need to use this form. So you fill out the purchase contract the way you normally do it, right? So you have the buyer's name. Now, normally I, the way I do it is, uh, uh, I will, I will usually create a folder. In this case, I probably have folders already. One, two, three, Highland. Okay, this is my listing. Just for illustration, the parties. So you got, let's say this person is the buyer assuming that this person buy it. And this is a seller, seller, and that's myself. So I got all the parties name completed. Now usually uh, the seller, you have the seller's na uh, first name and last name and the email. Same thing with the other seller. You have the first name, last name, and the email. And then for me, I'm all set up already. It's got the company name, Sentiment Realty Inc. And then the uh, phone number, if it's for Northern California, usually I use uh, Fremont uh, phone number. And this is our broker ID, which is the same as our license number for Santa Mac Realty. We use broker office ID for uh, your license number. So 0419-8203. And then the broker fax is just this number, 8003018290. And since I'm the listing agent, I'll put my name here, Kenny Tan. Agent ID is just my license number. And that's my phone number for agent phone. And my email, my cell phone number, my business fax. And the company's uh, address in Fremont. So I have this thing completed, okay? Now, uh, if you are in Southern California, you use whatever appropriate information for your uh, address and phone number and so forth. Once you have all the parties information filled out, then you can go ahead and go to the document. And uh, I need a special form. So I will look at the forms, right? So this is the form I need. If I open up the form now, <clears throat> give me a moment, be right back.
I am back. Just an urgent phone call. I have to return. Sorry about that. So we have the buyer's name. We have the property address. Notice that this is uh, auto-populated. I don't have to do any typing. I only need to type it once. Now, as far as the property goes, uh, I didn't show you that, but for the property, uh, you uh, you come back here. The place to input your property address is actually summary. So you go into summary and then you go ahead and put in your property address, okay? I took care of uh, parties and now it's just the document. And uh, so everything is populated. Makes my job a lot easier. Let's say for example, the sale price is 685,000. See that when I type in the number, uh, the letters for the purchase price automatically will show up. So all I gotta do is just type in the number, the purchase price. And if I want the escrow to close in 30 days, I just put down 30, uh, this 30 days here. Usually we go by the number of days. Let's say for example, I put uh, 21 days after acceptance which is uh, like the norm here these days, okay? You can put whatever days you're comfortable with. And the uh, listing agent is Santa Mac Realty. Let's say we are also the uh, selling agent. So, so we actually represent both the buyer and the seller. This form is different from the regular car form. It has a referral uh, licensee. So it does have the referral licensee. And uh, this form was actually published on December of 2015. It, it does look a little different. If you don't have any referral agent, then you just skip it. Finance term, usually we go 3% uh, of the purchase price, so that's about 3%, about 21,000, okay? Now, if uh, this person is uh, paying all cash, then, I, 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 then you will automatically show the remaining sum Okay, balance of purchase price or down payment. So this is the balance of the purchase price because this person is a cash buyer. So you will see here all cash offer, okay. Then we don't have to fill out the rest. Usually verification of down payment and closing costs, you know, most uh, most sellers will would uh, look for them when the buyer submits the offer. So uh, you can leave this as a default. That's fine. Loan application three days default. There is no loan contingency. Okay, so it's actually zero days because I don't. Uh, let's say let's say let's say. I'm not asking you to have zero loan contingency every time, but I have to tell you though, if you are competing in the Bay Area, you have any kind of contingency at all, you can pretty much forget it, okay? So no loan contingencies, plus in this case, you're all cash. Obviously, you don't have any loan contingency, right? So we're not even talking about loan contingency. The only thing we need to worry about is the appraisal contingency now, right? So uh, do I have any appraisal contingency? I know I don't want any appraisal contingency if, if I'm trying to compete, right? Now, why is it that I don't find appraisal contingency here? Maybe it's in another section. As you can see, this form is different. I don't see any uh, appraisal contingency at this location. Maybe it's in another location. 
Okay, we'll look for it later on. Okay. Now, because it's in San Francisco, who pays for escrow fee in San Francisco? Charles, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's say uh, uh, I'm the listing agent, so I pick the, the title and the escrow. Okay. And in San Francisco, seller also pay for title insurance. Wait a minute. It's buyer pay. Oh yeah, that's right. Buyer pays. Yeah, that's right. Buyer pays. That's right. San Francisco buyer pays. So first American title company, right? Now, how do I know that? The easiest way will be to check this chart over here. Okay, to be sure. If you go to your agents folder, there's a chart over here. You see me use this chart a lot. By now, you should know which chart I'm talking about now. Right? Who pays what closing cost, right? Just look it up and you can tell San Francisco buyer pays for escrow and buyer pays for title. Okay? So, so this part is correct. And, uh, CD transfer tax, well, what does the chart say? San Francisco? Seller, seller pay for CD uh, transfer tax, right? Mm -hmm. So we make the seller pay, okay? So we say seller pay for, count. well, seller always pay for county transfer tax pretty much. And CD seller also pays, right? Okay, now HOA transfer fees, usually we make the seller pay. And uh, who pay for HOA fee for preparing all documents? Usually, we make the seller pay, although it's negotiable, okay? Certification fee, always the buyer pay. You know who, why buyer pays for certification fee? Usually, if the buyer does not have a lender, it's all cash, there is no certification required from uh, the HOA. But if the buyer has a loan, the lender wants the HOA to certify certain things, so there is a certification. So the buyer actually pays for the certification fee, okay? But if none required, then the buyer doesn't have to pay anything, okay? Possession, really, if you have no specific date for possession, usually we do it on the date of the close. So you, you check on the date of the close. But if you need to be after the close, to deliver possession, you just indicate how many days you want after the close to deliver possession, okay? Disclosure, now these are the standard, the natural hazard disclosure. Notice one thing though, there is nothing in this form, I don't know why they designed the form this way. There is nothing in the form to indicate that the seller or the buyer is going to pay for the NHD, right? So this is one place where it's different from uh, your regular RPA because there's nowhere on the form to indicate who's paying for the natural hazard disclosure, right? Natural hazard disclosure, why doesn't it say somewhere in the form that the seller will pay for the NHD? Interesting. So if you represent the buyer, you want the seller to pay for NHD, you should put it on the addendum because it's not on the form, right? Okay. Now it says here, uh, uh, <clears throat> seller shall disclose if property is located in any zone identified in paragraph 6A. So since seller is disclosing, I suppose, uh, you know, buyer doesn't have to worry about paying for it, right? It's the seller who's paying for it. So in a way, even though it's different form, but the seller is paying for the NHD according to uh, paragraph six. And then it says here, uh, condominium. Property is a, is a condominium, and sellers shall provide to buyer copies of CCNR, 
articles of incorporation bylaws and other documents statement regarding uh, limited enforceability of uh, age restrictions. This is just your standard uh, HOA disclosure. And it says seller supposed to uh, provide that. Usually, when you open escrow, you're supposed to make your seller pay for it. That way you get the documents ready. The worst thing that can happen is you don't do it just before escrow closes, and then you realize you have to order HOA docs. You start ordering. How many days of delay you think you're going to get? Sometimes as long as two weeks delay. You don't do it, you're going to have a lot of people upset at you. Seller, buyer, the other agent, all upset at you because you did not order your HOA docs early. You wait until the last moment. Don't forget, order your HOAs as soon as you open escrow, even before you find your buyer. It costs a few hundred dollars to order HOA docs. Who pays for it? Your seller will pay for it. And uh, Megan Law disclosure is about, you know, uh, it's about sex offenders. It's a standard disclosure. Withholding uh, taxes, that's a FIPTA disclosure. We know that, right? That's a separate disclosure. Natural gas and hazardous uh, liquid transmission pipeline, same thing. Standard ones, these are the ones that you see in your standard uh, car form anyway. Uh, standard uh, RPA. If the, they are standard RPA, I, I would not go into them, okay? I only want to focus on things that are non-standard. Number seven is non-standard. If you have a condo conversion, usually you have a public report. If your condo conversion requires a BIE approval, but if it does not require a BIE approval, more likely there is no public report. Bonded debt usually has to do with uh, BIE requirements. HOA docs, yeah, for sure you want to give HOA docs. This is the first time selling uh, uh, a condo. Transportation corridor, this one does not apply to my listing, so I leave it unchecked. Airport zone, no. Bias inspection advisory, yes. Property uh, disclosure uh, statement, uh, I may or may not have it. If I have it, I'll provide. Utility disclosure, uh, depending on uh, if I have it or not. Water heater. Water heater is just your, uh, you know, the water heater compliance, the straps for the water heater. Zone report, I may not have it. Notice of a special tax, I may not have it. Spoke detector. I don't know why they want to design the form this way. Can't they make it the same as the uh, RPA? Because now they're creating confusion here. Uh, I don't have any other disclosure, but my unit is not the one that require BIE approval. So technically I don't have any uh, final report, but if yours is one that actually, if you have five or more units, apartment complex that you converted into condo, you will need a public report. So you have to go through a BIE. So these boxes will be checked. But since mine is only four units, I don't have final public report and I don't have conditional uh, public report, okay? and I would not have amended public report. Uh, condition of property renovations and statement of defects per civil code section 1134. Now, when you are a seller, you sell a condo conversion for the first time, uh, there's one big difference. For a normal uh, non-condo conversion, does the seller have to do a visual inspection or no? The answer is no. You just disclose based on your knowledge. You don't have to do a visual inspection. Only agents do visual inspection. Condo conversion is different though. Condo conversion, a seller has to do a visual inspection. And then based on the visual inspection, 
the seller has to make certain disclosure. And the seller would have to make the disclosure on paragraph two about any defects or malfunctions. And the places that the seller would have to inspect will be the roof, the wall, floors, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, electrical systems, or components of a similar or comparable nature. And recreation, uh, rec recreation, re recreational facilities. And then based on the disclosure, now let me ask you this, uh, do you have to do a TDS if you are selling condo conversion for the first time? Um, if you are selling condo conversion for the first time, and usually if you have like a public report, you don't need a TDS. But if you don't have a public report, then you need a TDS. The, even the form itself doesn't mention about TDS. Whereas in your RPA, TDS is mentioned. Okay, so it does not appear like uh, you need a TDS done. But if uh, I wanna play it safe, I'll do a TDS anyway. I'll ask my seller to do a TDS and ask him to do a visual also. So a seller will do a TDS and a visual for condo conversion, or my listing anyway, okay? It says here, a buyer is strongly advised to conduct investigations of the entire property in order to determine its present condition. Seller may not be aware of all the effects affecting the property or other factors that buyer considers important. Property improvements may not be built according to code compliance with current law or have had uh, permits issued. Nothing new. Uh, conditions of property renovations and statement of defects per Cal BRE regulations. Now, in my case, I, mine was not a project where BRE approval was required. So number 10 does not apply to me. But if BIE approval is required, number 10 would apply to you. Okay, so I'll skip number 10 because it doesn't apply to me anyway. Title of vesting is uh, standard, so I don't go over that, okay? And then paragraph 14 is uh, standard, just like your regular uh, residential purchase agreement. And all of these are standard. However, paragraph 16 is not standard. That one talks about purchase money distribution to third parties. Pursuant to Cal BIE regulation 2791B, distributions and charges may be made against buyer's deposits to seller. These charges under regulation 2791B and seller's estimate such charges are set for below. Uh, this is when you're selling condo for the first time and your condo project is subject to BRE's approval. So you need to fill out number 16. Seventeen talks about retention of buyer's de deposit in the event of buyer's default. In the event seller has used buyer's deposits pending consummation of this agreement, seller shall immediately upon alleging buyer's default transmit to escrow holder funds equal to all of buyer's deposits are so used. Uh, so in case the buyer is in default and seller has used the buyer's deposit previously, okay, for uh, their own purpose, and suddenly the buyer say, I'm not buying the proper procedure. Let's say for example, the buyer reserve uh, the unit and uh, gave reservation for $5,000. That $5,000 has been used for other, maybe not used, but they were deposited into seller's account. Uh, when a buyer's default, that money has to be transmitted to the escrow. Okay. Uh, prorations and property taxes, these are just uh, standard, so I will not go over it. 
and the rest of the provisions are standard okay however uh, look at this here a couple of provisions that are non-standard 24. buyer hereby represents a buyer's buying the property for buyer's own account this agreement and the related escrow may not be assigned or otherwise trans transferred by buyer voluntarily or by operation of law by buyer under this agreement or without the written consent of a seller to a specified assignee and any attempt to do so shall be now void and no effect and a default by buyer under this agreement what that means is is that you know if the buyer decided not to buy it and find someone else to buy it they need the seller's consent before they can transfer the contract to someone else okay Manufactured products, maintenance, and limited warranties. Uh, this one basically is saying that if the seller received uh, warranties from manufactured products, such as a new AC or new something that comes with the warranty, uh, the seller shall provide copies of these uh, warranties or maintenance uh, documents to the buyer okay this is usually this is not in your regular rpa it's an added provision even the broker commission compensation is not in your regular uh, rpa it, it is a uh, added provision So you have a choice of disclosing your commission here or not disclosing it. That's totally up to you. There's really no need to disclose it here. Representative capacity standard, joint escrow instruction standard. Okay. Now, interesting, this is non-standard. It says here on D, if the property is subject to a public report, the following additional escrow instructions apply. Blanket uh, encumbrance. It says here, if there's blanket encumbrance, not as a condition of seller's duty to complete performance, but solely for the benefit of buyer, the escrow shall not close, funds shall not be released from escrow, and title shall not be conveyed to buyer until all of the following conditions have been met. So there are some requirements, but this is for ESCO to worry about. It's not for you, so you don't really need to know very much about it, okay? But ESCO needs to pay attention to this paragraph. Liquidated damages, uh, it looks a little different than the RPA, but they should be very similar. So you just have your uh, buyer initial, the uh, liquidated uh, damages uh, clause, which is up here. This is where your buyer and the seller would uh, initial. So it's different from your RPA. For RPA, this is actually at the bottom of the paragraph, whereas uh, for this form, it's actually at the top of the paragraph, okay, right here. But the language is quite similar, although it does look a little different, okay? Don't worry about it. Let's go and check the appropriate, uh, initial the appropriate boxes. Uh, mediation clause, arbitration, the same. Arbitration, you just have your uh, buyer and seller initials here. There are some differences. C3 is different. C3, you don't find C3 in your regular RPA. Although it might be the same though. It says uh, brokers and referral licensees shall not be obligated or compelled to mediate. That is true. But if they want to mediate or arbitrate, they may participate. But the sellers and the buyers cannot force them to participate in mediation or arbitration. 
the rest are standard okay so i don't go over them okay uh a couple of things i want to draw your attention has to do with uh, when is it that you can serve a demand to close the escrow let's say escrow is supposed to close august the first how soon can you serve a demand to close escrow on the buyer you have to wait until august 31st to serve the demand to close escrow or can you serve sooner what if you want to save time you want to serve sooner how soon okay the answer is here in this paragraph paragraph 14. It says here, close of escrow. Before a seller or buyer may cancel this agreement for failure of the other party to close escrow, pursuant to this agreement, buyer seller must first deliver to the other party a demand to close escrow. The demand to close shall be signed by the applicable buyer seller and give the other party at least three days after delivery to close escrow. What that means is, um, uh, <clears throat> The DO, uh, the demand to close escrow may not be delivered any earlier than three days prior to the scheduled close of escrow. What if you have a very impatient seller? He wants to serve the demand to close escrow before August 31st. When is the earliest he can serve it? August 28th. What happens if he serves on August 27th? Do we have a valid demand to close escrow? No. So it cannot be sooner than three days before the scheduled uh, closing date. It can be later, but not earlier than three days before the uh, closing date. Okay, got that? Make sure you know this rule, okay? If you don't know this rule, when you represent a buyer, they serve you with a demand to close escrow, then you're wondering, how can they serve before the escrow closing date? Yes, they can. As long as they serve it no earlier than three days before close. No question. All right. Uh, that's pretty much sums up, okay? This is the uh, purchase agreement that you have to use if your seller is selling his condo conversion for the first time after you, the units are converted. Okay, Rita, what's your question? Is it closed after the, the close of escort date? Do you have any uh, other form of justification you need? No, as long as nobody objects. So basically, let's say, for example, the buyer could not get the loan in time, and then the loan did not get funded until September 1st, and then now it looks like September 2nd is the closing date. Can the seller say, well, you're late by one day, I don't want to sell it to you anymore? The answer is no. In order for the seller to say that, the seller must have first served a demand to close escrow and the buyer still did not meet the deadline. So in other words, if the seller served on August 28th, a properly prepared uh, demand to close escrow and comes uh, August 31st, buyer did not close. September 1st, the seller can cancel the escrow and sell it to someone else. But the prerequisite is the seller must have served a demand to close escrow. Seller never served that too bad. But he's already closed on September 2nd. You can't say, well, I'll take your money back. You're too late now. Because you never serve a demand to close escrow. Okay, so if he's late, he's late. That's okay. The escrow will still close. Okay, got that? Okay, great. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending today's uh, session.